uh, in Matthew 5, so let's turn there. <clears throat> Um, and uh, I think I think we're ready to move to verse two. <clears throat> but we'll read one and two. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was seated, when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, <clears throat> "All right, this verse two is what I want to really look at right now." And he opened his mouth and he taught them saying. Um, in Matthew here, we're not merely dealing with Jesus as a teacher or, or that Jesus of Nazareth guy or the Jesus that we know as our Savior. Um, they don't, you know, this is his first major public appearance with a whole lot of people. Um, and, and, um, uh, the question arises because, see, when I say that, what I mean is nobody really knows him. So they don't know what they're going to get. They don't know who he really is. Um, and <clears throat> so the question is, who has appeared to teach us? And uh, to answer that, keep your place here as usual. But let's go over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John 1, <clears throat> and what I'd like to share in this session, um, I would like to really ask you to be open to the Holy Spirit because I don't think that I'm adequate to really um, communicate the one that I've seen correctly. And I don't think there are words that can really fully do that. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you to just ask the Holy Spirit right now if he wouldn't be your teacher. And so, uh, Gospel of John, verse uh, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. <clears throat> um, the, the Word word there is logos. Most of you know that. Um, and so very simply, the logos in the beginning, well, let's start with this. John, John has a different beginning from the other gospel writers, and some of y'all know this. Some of them start with... Uh, the genealogy, one of them starts with the genealogy, another one starts with the ministry of John the Baptist, as if that's the beginning. <clears throat> John takes us back all the way to the beginning, but, but more than the beginning, because the beginning of creation doesn't start until verse three. Um, he takes us to the beginning that began the creation in all things. And he calls him the Logos calls him the Logos, and the Logos was with God, but the Logos was God. Now, that's important as we discover the Logos. What, what did God have in mind when he had John write in the beginning was the Logos? Because he could have used anything. And, and we know from, you know, if Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which most people agree that he did, <clears throat> then Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But this says in the beginning um, was the word, in the beginning was the logos. <clears throat> and let me just say this, this is the one who came and sat down on that mountain to teach them. Okay. Because they didn't have any other designations for him. They didn't have a healer yet. They didn't have, you know what I mean? Uh, they didn't have a lot of stuff. This is the one John said came. <clears throat> and um, so my goal is to comprehend the Logos as God comprehends it. 
And, um, and I know that, that our basic comprehension is this, or mine, uh, and probably most of ours, is he's the word, but the Bible with the ink on white paper is the scriptures, and Jesus is the life of the scriptures, so he's the logos, which is the word. So in the beginning was the living word. <clears throat> but I believe that there's, I believe there's much more here, and that's why I'm asking you to ask the Holy Spirit. Um, I believe that there's something amazing here in this. Um, so how are we gonna comprehend the logos? Well, first of all, you know, we usually look to definitions. Now definitions only start us, you know, it's very empty compared to meeting him. But um, so the definition of logos, and what I'm gonna give you is the definition of logos as it was used by the Greeks the first time, the first person that ever used it who was not a Christian. And this word got adopted by John. So let's hear what the original word logos was defined as so that we can see one, maybe a reason why John picked it, okay? Okay. <clears throat> His definition was to designate the divine reason or plan which coordinates a changing universe. To, de to designate the divine reason or plan which co coordinates a changing universe. All right, I added something in that so it would help us in relationship because because when that, that Greek person used that and wrote that and wrote that definition, he didn't know Jesus. <clears throat> so here's what I added to it. To designate the divine reason or plan summed up in a person which coordinates a changing universe. All right. Well, just right off the bat, the lamb answers that definition, folks. Yes. The lamb answers that definition. The, the word logos is a designation, is a designation for the divine reason, the plan that, that, that was initiated and is summed up in a person that coordinates a changing universe, meaning everything changed, a new creation came into being. And everything changed. And the old creation, as far as God was concerned, passed away uh, with the Lamb of God. So, so this is a whole new approach. I realize this. this is a whole new approach that I want to show you in, in some scriptures and some things where I believe that this is a, a true designation that the Lamb of God, not just on the cross, but by virtue of our union with him, which did happen on the cross, has literally coordinated a whole change of universe, as it were. All right. So as Logos, he is not yet conceptualized, but stands as the unknown God, meaning <clears throat> that this is the way I believe that God's trying to present um, Jesus, but Jesus is already reduced down in people's minds. You know what I mean? Christians, you say Jesus... And it's already reduced down to the guy that saved us or the guy that had a beard and sandals and all that kind of stuff. But for these guys that are about to hear him teach, this is really their first big introduction. Okay, so they, so uh, that's why I said um, as Logos, that's the Logos sitting there about ready to open his mouth. As Logos, he is not yet conceptualized. Now that's important. Um, but stands right now to their comprehension, the unknown God. Because they don't know who this is. Their version of God was Jehovah, which was for the Jews, and certainly wasn't a lamb slain, amen? All right. So, as a, uh, um, so here's another definition. Uh, as the Logos, he is the, and this is my word in, so this gets a little difficult, so I'm going to write it down. The,
This is a little difficult, so he is the being, the logos is the being of a concept or ideal. Okay, he's, the, you see how it could be difficult. We could read that, that he is, he is being, he is being a concept. He's not just being that, he is the being, the being of whatever this will come out in terms of concept or idea. In other words, he's not a concept or idea, but he is the being of the one that we start trying to conceptualize him yes. with. Yes. Okay. All right. So as Logos, he's the being of that. He is not the formed conceptualization of him yet. That's going to happen. You see that in John. In the beginning was the Word. Word's with God. God knows who he is. God knows this. But we don't have a clue of what he's calling Logos. All right. So as the Logos, he is the being of a concept, an idea that is totally foreign to any human mind. Okay. So we're talking about the unknown God right here. We're talking about the Logos as yet sitting on a hill in front of, sitting on a mountain in front of them, and they don't know who this is, and they would never be able to come up with who he is in their own minds and conceptions. All right. <clears throat> so he is the being of a concept, an ideal that is totally foreign to any human mind, a person more abstract than we could ever formulate in our minds on our own, just its mention demands that we leave familiar harbors. All right. So this is important because if, if, you, if you, I don't know how to say this, if you, if you begin to conceptualize him as the lamb slain, the lamb slaughtered, you would never have thought God was that. You would never have gone there. Not God. Okay. We only, we're only familiar with it because we've been taught it. But you never would have done that. And as the Logos, he is that complete thought and ideal of God. This is it. This is what it's about. And that's the, the definition that you usually get is that the Logos is the complete thought and ideal of God. If you have a Schofield, it probably says that because I've used that for so many years. But it, that the Logos represents this is my ideal of what I want. This is my idea of what is honorable. This is my idea of what is virtuous. This, this Logos that is going to begin to express himself so that we may find out who he is. So for us, we're at a disadvantage when Jesus sits down on that mountain and starts teaching because for them, they don't know. But for us, we've already got it figured out. It's some guy that walks around and he does this and he teaches and he, all this kind of stuff. But if we knew, if we knew the logos and who that concept and idea was in the heart of God and the being of that one, <clears throat> then these words in Matthew 5 and 6 and 7 would, would reach us on a completely different level. They would impact us and not just be, well, blessed the merciful for they should. You know, that, that little phrase is so empty without a recognition of the being behind it. And not just the concept of it, but the being that is behind it. The logos of God behind it. All right. <clears throat> um, so aside from definitions, the next best way to know the logos is to meet him. And we begin to, we begin to have that introduction in uh, <clears throat> verse 14. And the logos was made flesh. Just stop right there. <clears throat> Because everything else is just, and he dwelt among us. The Logos was made flesh. Now this is huge. I'm telling you, this is not what we think it is. 
we've always formulated, we, me and Deb, uh, <laughs> we've always formulated in our mind that Jesus is God and, you know, and God just came down and he became incarnated. That's probably the best way to say it, that really incarnated means made flesh. So God came down and he was just incarnate. God was incarnated. And it's such a common teaching that it robs us of the reality that these, this little bit right here is screaming and the word was made Okay, God was made flesh. So made flesh equals a creature that is weak, perishable, finite, temporal, gross, whatever. And I wrote down, only God knows the true depth of that empty state that we think so highly of concerning our con condition called flesh. God became flesh. Right. Our hope to understand this is the cornerstone of New Testament teaching. And it is, and it is. You say, well, the cross is. Well, this is the thing that Paul refers to. The, the, I think one of the greatest statements in the whole Bible is what he says in Philippians. And I'm jumping a little bit ahead here to, to give his explanation, but, but he talks about not just that Jesus humbled himself and, you know, and died on a cross, but that he was in the form of God and he became man. And he kept humbling himself. He kept manifesting the depth of this being this logos that we're now discovering, the being of lamb. And the incarnation was picked right up there with the cross, except it's not the incarnation. It's not the incarnation. It is not the incarnation. It's not God was incarnated. That is what it's trying to communicate here. All right. so. When John chose the Logos becoming flesh, now we've changed it. We're not just talking about the Logos. We're talking about when, God, when John chose the Logos becoming flesh in order to explain this God behind the veil, he opened the door to us being able to grasp the wisdom of God. He set forth the idea of God expressing himself in order to demonstrate his nature. God express the logos of God, the unknown God, the 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 total thought and concept of God, the um where is it? The the designation of the divine reason or plan summed up in a person which coordinates a changing universe. John, John's looking at that definition. He's going, oh my God, that's the Lamb of God. The Logos of God is the Lamb of God. All right, let's stay on this track. Um, so I'm going to repeat I'm going to repeat the last two sentences. <clears throat> when John chose the Logos becoming flesh, and, and it's so important that you ask the Holy Spirit to breathe on, I've got that in parentheses, to breathe on the Logos becoming flesh. The Word was made flesh, right? That We're so familiar with that phrase. The Logos becoming flesh represents like I said, just one of the cornerstones of New Testament uh, meanings and teaching. When John chose the Logos becoming flesh in order to explain this God behind the veil, he opened the door for us to begin to grasp the wisdom of God. All right, so he's setting for, uh, 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 Matthew says, you know, uh, in the beginning, and most of them use the beginning, and the beginning of the gospel, I think Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he starts with John the Baptist declaring Jesus. Matthew says, 
you know, the, the beginning was the genealogy that led up to Jesus coming. John says, this completely fathomless unknown being that represents to God, the Father and the Holy Spirit, his total thought and concept and is the divine designation of what God has in mind manifested and he was made flesh. He was made contemptible flesh. He was made temporal. A being that is he was made small, smaller than small. He was made less. Are you getting starting to get the picture? He was made so below what he is, and yet this was his manifestation of logos. The logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. Oh my God, I've got goosebumps. I'm telling you, this is, this is if, we, if the Spirit of God breathes this, it, you'll just go, oh my Lord. All right, so, um, so he set, John set forth the idea of God expressing himself in order to demonstrate his nature, his first act of expressing himself was he was made the smallest, worst, you know, thing, flesh, human flesh. Okay, so this weak image of a God, God made flesh, this weak image of a God is the embodiment of the unknown God. This one that is manifesting as just a weak carpenter son, man, and then you know, he humbles himself even more and becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This weak image of God is the embodiment of the unknown God. When he, with with that pen, that eternal pen, and he just wrote it down. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and the Logos was made flesh. Bam! It just ripped our, our universe in half and, and makes us realize a whole nother Universe, uh, I, I, um, I really like the way this guy said it. He, it is a designation uh, to designate the divine reason or plan summed up in a person which coordinates. This is the coordination of a changing universe. This lamb and his way and his spirit and his nature is going to bring radical change to everything. <clears throat> Uh, so Jesus as God made in the form and substance of human flesh is the revelation of the complete thought of the God called Logos word word Jesus as God made in the form and substance of human flesh is the revelation of the complete thought of the God called Logos. He is, he's not wasting any time. <laughs> he is not wasting any time. He is hitting this earth with a bam. And he's saying, this is what I'm about. I'm not about being in king's palaces. Remember, he said that of John the Baptist. You came, what'd you come out to see? What do you think you're going to see? Do you think you're going to see a king in fancy clothes? No, that's not what we're about. That's not what my forerunner's about. That's not what I'm about. He's declaring me, and I'm declaring this is what we're about. Yeah. Uh, that's what he said to the devil, too. He said, it is written, meaning he's the word that is written. He, that is he. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and 
He didn't take his power and just slap the devil around. He's going, look, I'm it. You know, you're trying to get me to get on board with something you think is it. I'm it, and I'm proving it by, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. If you're the son of God, turn the stones into bread. If you're the son of God, prove it by being better than everybody else, more powerful, more anything, prove it. And he goes, I don't have to prove it. I am the logos of God. I am the logos of God. Well, you're, you're thirsting and you're hungry. I have bread to eat, you know not of. You know. There's a humility, there's a lowering, there's a, 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 a willingness for lowliness, for, for not just humility, get ready, not just a, a willingness for humility, but for humiliation. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, more powerful than maybe we, we realize. I love the fact that that's how um, uh, Luke translated that in the book of Acts from Isaiah 53. And he said, in, in his humiliation, in the midst of his humiliation, he is, he is demonstrating this is. This is the beginning and the end and the out. This is the logos of God. <clears throat> the word become, f becomes flesh in the first real glimpse into knowing God. Okay, I, I want you to see that. That this, this act of God coming down and being that and being okay with it. See, and, and a lot of people go, well, yeah, well, Jesus walked and he was lowly and humble, but now he sits on the throne. He's a lamb on a throne. Like I've said, I've said to you many times, you know, the Holy Spirit had to instruct me too, but he, he said, what's the present day ministry of Jesus? You know, what is, his, what is his main ministry? What does this New Testament declare his main ministry is now with us? And it, I went, gosh, you know, I mean, at first I was kind of going, well, look, he, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. We come boldly to him and, and we, you know, with our problems and our needs. And he's king of kings and lord of lords. And yet he says, y'all come to me and bring me your problems and I'll, I'll help. I'll work. I'll da, da 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 I'll be your servant on a throne. That's what he's doing. That's his present. That's the present day ministry of Jesus. Check it out. You know, you'd think, wielding all that power, <laughs> if they're, you know, oh, there's, there's an earthquake and it's going to hurt some people. Stop right now. And, and uh, you know, oh, they're, they're starving to death. Look at all of the millions starving in Africa. I'll fix that. Bread, manna, I'll do it again. And yet that's the God many people worship, but he's on the throne and he's just serving us as if we're kings. And he's just a lowly servant. All right, so <clears throat> Paul's explanation. Uh, Paul saw in the incarnation slash crucified one <clears throat> the embodiment of the logos. Okay, now remember everything we've talked about thus far We've been talking about what John saw, right? Right? We've been in the Gospel of John. Now we're going to go take a look at, at Paul. And we're going to see if Paul has embraced this same thing and, and uh, understood it. I, wrote, I put down here, Paul saw in the incarnated, crucified one, the embodiment of the Logos. In other words, the, the explanation of the unknown God. <clears throat> the divine concept, the demonstration, the definition, the explanation, crucified God, uh, incarnated, God incarnated in flesh. This is the embodiment of him. 
So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. <clears throat> All right. We read it just like that. No, that's how we read Well, okay. We preach this thing, and, you know, and it's the da-da-da-da. And uh, so, you know, we have these explanations and ideas. <clears throat> Some of you know that the word preaching is actually the word logos or logo, whatever. Logos. Um, it's logos. In other words, it's the same word as in the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God. And I can hear the Spirit say, and the Logos is God. It's God. <laughs> so he says, so Paul, now Paul is caught hold of this, and he, he makes a statement, for the Logos of the cross, anybody see it? See it following there? It's the Logos of the cross now. It is the full manifestation of the depth. It's not the only manifestation of the Logos, because when he was, the Logos was made flesh. But it is the full manifestation of the depth Logos, that is Lamb, will go in selfless giving. Take all the blame, be spit on, he's God, he's powerful. And yet, he's not... Do, do you get the feeling Jesus is fighting with, you know, really wanting to kill them all, you know, and just make toast out of them? No. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It, um, it was years ago that the Lord first uh, started sharing a bunch with me, and I was writing it down, and I entitled it, and I've never really shared on it, but I entitled it, Jesus was comfortable with the cross. <laughs> Jesus was comfortable with the cross. And we're not most of the time. I mean, we're, we're comfortable with him on the cross. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But not us, you know, especially. And we're, we're actually comfortable with us on the cross as long as it's a theological concept that we can talk about in Bible school. But when the time comes to be in it, it's contrary to our nature unless he's formed in us. <clears throat> All right, so in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it is the logos of the cross that Paul refers to. It's not just that we preach the cross. It is the complete thought and manifestation of God. Logos. All right. So, um, Paul didn't just conceptualize this Logos, which, by the way, if you'll notice, to a certain degree throughout the New Testament, the term logos begins to fade somewhat compared to like, in the beginning was the logos and the logos was with God and the logos, he is God. Begins to fade and especially towards the end, like book of Revelation, or whatever, the lamb begins to come, rise more and more and more to the top because lamb is the revealed unknown logos. Can y'all kind of see that? Because at first, remember, okay, I'm trying to make sure, but the, the, in the beginning, he was the Logos, and he was with God, and he was God, but we had no explanation. Jesus sat down on that mount and was going to teach, and they didn't know who this was. But at that point, to them, to not to them, but to those who know, that's the Logos teaching, the unconceptualized 
God that will, in his words, declare his spirit, which that's what we're going to get into the next classes. Blessed are the, those who are persecuted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you that hunger and thirst. Blessed, you see what I mean? Blessed are you. You've been brought into something. This is the highest blessing, greater than Mount Gerizim. Greater than the blessings of Abraham. This is, is being, this is and will be, was and is and is to come. All right, so Paul is grasping this and he he decides that this logos in conceptualized as Lamb of God is supposed to live in him. Okay? The lo in the beginning one. That when it was just the beginning and no one else understood who he was but God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So, uh, over in Philippians, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> and starting with verse 4, <clears throat> and of course you, you know chapter 2 and, you know, it made himself of no reputation. Let's go ahead and look at 2, 7. He didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God raised that up and said, I exalt this and I put this where everything is going to bow their knee to it. This Logos manifested as lamb, the true nature of what Logos has really means. So, Paul in chapter 3, verse 4, now he's talking about himself, not what Jesus did. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, <laughs> if any other man think that he hath reasons for which that he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ. So he is, he is big, he is known, he is uh, famous, he is <clears throat> reputable, he is, he, is, he is everything that you would want to become so that you could be a minister and accepted as a minister of God. Can I get amen? amen? He is every, he's got the credentials. <clears throat> and he says, but Christ, I, I, want, I want to gain Christ, or I want to gain Christ crucified, or I want to gain the Lamb, or I want to gain the Logos of God. To do that, he's going to do exactly what Jesus did. Amen. Jesus was God, and he gave it all up and became lower than low, low. And Paul's got all of this. He says, I give it up to you. I want to gain this spirit. I want to gain the real thing. <clears throat> so he says, um, verse 7, what things were gained to me, I count loss for Christ. In other words, gain is loss and loss is gain. I told you you wouldn't comprehend this, you know. You, you, never, you would never conceptualize the logos as slaughtered lamb. You just wouldn't. And that he's okay with the cross. And he's okay with getting low and being low. It's just his nature. It's all right. He doesn't have to go, well, I'm going to do this for them. You know, looking down on our sin and go, I'm going to do this for them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and uh, I'll be there for 33 and a half years. Uh, the worst of it will be uh, 
three and a half years of ministry, and then they'll hang me on the cross, and then I'll be up again, and everything will be great, and I'll be exalted. He's only, he wasn't seeking exaltation. The Father exalted him. I mean, that's important. And in the book of Hebrews, it talks about that too. He didn't put himself forward and say, da 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 da, you know, I should be a, 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 a priest or whatever. Said, and then God said, I, by an oath, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, you don't, you and I don't fully, and I don't, don't recognize the full power of this endless self-giving life. We don't understand that fully. We, we look at it in circumstances and we meet it out according to, you know, different things. But for Jesus, it's just the way he is. Right. You know, he's not, he's not having to go, well, no, what should I do in this situation? Or, or, or you know, reacts and then goes, well, I guess I better lay down my life or somebody will see it and think less of me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, his is, it's that picture that I saw Jesus, you know, standing there and I saw, I'm looking at one, everything about him is one. It's not a bunch. He's, he's so perfectly symmetric. He's, you know, and I'm not talking about a vision. I'm talking about a, 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 I'm talking about an explanation from the Holy Spirit of the perfection of oneness of nature and being and letting everything flow from that. He's got it. He has got it. Praise God. So uh, in verse... Um, Eight, yea, doubtless. Anybody ever notice those words? Yea, doubtless. I can't. Yea, doubtless. Okay. Have you ever, you're going to lay down your life or give up something and have some doubts? Mm -hmm. If you're willing to give that up or is that really the Lord because I really don't want to lose that? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we all have. I certainly, you know, have. Paul goes, yea, doubtless, because I think he's on to something here. See, he's really, really on the trail. He's not just beating around the bushes trying to get it to fly out of the bush somewhere. <laughs> something like that. So, um, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but poop, that I may win Christ. Count it but dung. Jesus is number one and we're number two. <clears throat> Somebody says, praise God. I'm, I'm second. That's not what I mean, but nevertheless, <clears throat> I don't think that's what Paul means either. <clears throat> That I may win Christ, that I may gain Christ in the Spanish is what it says. That I may gain this spirit and this nature and I'm moving in that direction. And I'm going to, because, you know, if, if you seek to save, you lose. But if you lose, you're going to gain. So he's losing as fast as he can that he may gain Christ. And be found in him. And see, here's the deal. He didn't say, and be found in him so that I have all of the blessings that are in Christ. You know, you have been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3. And so we go, so I want to be found in him. Paul says, I want to be found in him not having anything of my own. In other words, he, he really comprehends, well, first of all, he comprehends what the exchange is really about. And, but the main thing is he comprehends that that would be contrary to his spirit. To be found in him and wanting to gain all of this, he's literally saying, I'm giving this up that I'd only gain him. And that to gain him is going to cost me my life. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. There, whoop, there it is. There it is. 
because under the law or the mental concept, the mindset of law, it's still about us and it still involves judgments and comparisons and hopes and dreams, all related to our greater self that wants to blossom and expand so that everybody can see how wonderful we are. The, the road that we are on, folks, is a road where we're going to see and probably some other people are going to see how wretched we really are. Paul did. But there's an upside. Shortly, a few verses after, oh, wretched man that I am, a new realization came. But we don't discover this wretchedness by, uh, you know, standing at the counter, ordering a hamburger, and noticing that there's a little box there for, um, you know, you know, crippled kids, and we reach in and take a five or something. And then later on we go, oh my God, what is wrong with me? It's going to take more than that. Yes. <laughs> a lot more than that. Because we're in love with ourselves. <clears throat> and we need to be in love with Jesus only. You know, one love. All right, so... Um, that I may know him, this is verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. All right, so the, the power of his resurrection is the depth of his death. Okay, the power of resurrection. Okay, just forget every concept you have of resurrection and take into consideration a view like this just for a second, not that not you adopt it. Um, in the case of Jesus and in the case of Philippians 2, which, by the way, we're in the same book and it's just over in the next chapter, he, he kept getting lower and lower and lower and went deeper and deeper into death. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name higher and higher and higher above this, above that. Does that make sense? So if we wipe away all other concepts, then Paul is asking for the power of his resurrection to be like in Hebrews when they said they would not um, accept deliverance that they might have a greater resurrection. Well, that's, that, that verse wouldn't even make sense if it, you saw it in any other light than, than resur the power of resurrection is the depth of death. And those people in Hebrews figured it out. And so they wouldn't accept they wanted to go down deeper so there would be a greater resurrection. Okay? And, you know, and then Paul in Romans 6, he, he clarifies. He says, if, if then, if this happens, then this happens. That's a good old physics sort of way of teaching. If, then. If not, then. It's also good for teaching people how to turn on a, a light when they're walking into a dark room. If you flip this switch, light comes on. No switch flippy, walk in darkness. You see, if then, if you have been planted in the likeness of his death, then, see, you'll be in the likeness of his resurrection. And in fact, you'll walk in newness of life, which is different. Um, so we have to, we have to realize why Jesus was okay with this stuff and why Paul was okay with this stuff. It wasn't because they, you know, were masochists or sadists or any of that kind of stuff. It wasn't because they believed that sufferings were virtuous. Sufferings are not virtuous. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is virtuous to the Father. He's the Logos, the complete thought and concept of God that changes you know, it brings about a change in the universe. <clears throat> We're almost done. <laughs> if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained, Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ. I want to, 
I want to lay hold of, that's the actual words there in the Greek, I want to lay hold of the thing. It, it's like, it's, I don't, I don't know, it's, it's like I want to lay hold of the thing for which God has laid hold of me. He's laid hold of me, and I want to lay hold of what he has laid hold of me for. In other words, what is the hope of his calling? The hope, what is his hope in saving us? That's what he's after. That's what Paul is after. And it's really not about, see, it's not under the law where you're trying to, well, I just want to be good or righteous. He said, I, I gave up my own righteousness, not having my own righteousness so that I can lay hold of what he laid hold of me for. It's about his, what's in his heart. And I'm doing it only because he laid hold of me from this point of view. And I'll, I'll give up everything to be in this circle of, you know, the, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this flow of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've been brought into that, but there's not another circle added. We're in Christ. And that's the way they are. You know, I said to somebody the other day, I said, do you know why when the Holy Spirit, the actual real Holy Spirit, speaks to you from the Word or something and shows you something so powerful it just blows your mind, you know why it's so powerful? And they said, no. And I said, because he never, he's so self-giving, he never mentions himself. He never brings up his needs. He never brings up anything. It's deep, deep selflessness, and God honors that. And so there's power released in that death in that not declaring himself. He's, uh, I told him, I said, he's the only one that's invisible. We can't see the Father, but the Father exists. You know what I mean? And, and probably can be seen, but the Holy Spirit is invisible. Deeper death. Yeah. Most of us fight being invisible. Nobody even noticed me when I walked in the room. I'm, it's like I'm invisible. Can you hear that out of the mouth of the Holy Spirit? You know, the father, da, 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 and, the, and the father is so well known. All of us, everybody on the planet had a father. But whoever had a Holy Ghost, <laughs> you know? I mean, everything about him. You're like the wind. He blows, the, uh, I think he was here, you know? It's like he's so selfless in all of his being. And so is the father, and so is the son. And so, so there is this flow, and there, that's why they're one. This is one. You do realize this, don't you? This is God is one. This is that God is one. This is not, you, you know, I'm describing three, but I'm describing three in one. And that's what one is. And when you enter into that, then you enter into this, this place where you're, I'm only doing this because you've laid hold of me. I'm, I am after to lay hold of what you're laying hold of me for. Because it's not about me. It's about you. That sounds familiar. Hmm. Anyway, I still haven't finished the final scripture I'm going to do here. Uh, verse four, 13. <clears throat> Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. So what is, okay, let me just try to wrap this up. So what is, what is it like, what is a mindset? What is the way? What is the mentality? What is the judgments? What are the things that someone under the law does? Well, what they do is they, they keep records. They keep accounts. They remember. This says forgetting. Forget what's behind and press towards him. The mark of the prize, the high calling that, that is in him and is him. And so, but the, the law always keeps us in remembrance of, of uh, oh, well, you know, but this happened and then they did this. And why didn't they? You know, it's not just what they did. It's what they didn't do. <laughs> it's, it's insanity. It's like, well, they, somebody should have, well, you know, not if... Yes, if you're under the law, you know, it's about me, and they're not doing their part. But if it's about the lamb, do your part. Join with him and die. 
that I may know him, that, what did he say? And be made conformable to his death. And when you do that, see, because that's here, and then verses, few verses, five verses, six verses down, then it's forgetting those things which are be behind. I, you know, well, what about, forget it. But you see, and we wonder what the story is behind um, Lot's wife. What's the big deal with that? She lost the purpose. Salt is good, but if it loses its savor. And so she's, she's still turning around. She's still, well, what about this? And what about my home? And what about the, thing, the garden I worked so hard for? And what about, oh, what about our life, our life together? And what about, you're stuck in that position the rest of your life. You're stuck. You're just stuck. But you, but you forget. You know, forgetting has to be a regular thing. Forgive and forget. A lot of people forgive and never forget. Forgetting those things which are behind. I'm, what am I about? I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of Jesus. He's my prize. He's what I'm after. He's what I want. And this is my high calling. This is my high calling. What you're calling, brother, this is my high calling. I may do this or that. Paul said, I, you know, I, didn't I don't baptize. I didn't come to baptize. Okay, I did baptize so and so. But that's not my high calling. <laughs> sure, I do some other things, but that's not what, that's doesn't, that doesn't define me. What defines me is this lamb spirit, what defines me is this way that is in God. And that, and the definition of that is, it's not about me. It's not about my ministry. It's not about the things, you know, it's not about Isaac. Well, God gave me Isaac. You know, God gave me this ministry. I know he did. He gave you that ministry to give it up. <laughs> now, you wonder, you wonder why we have such full classrooms, and, and uh, I think we got about 15 on Skype tonight, but you wonder why me is part of the problem. I say this stuff. And I'm not afraid to say it. And I'm not afraid of the repercussions because this is the truth. This is God's truth. This is his heart. This isn't Randy's heart. My heart is deceitfully wicked. If Christ's heart is not formed in me, I'm worse than all of you. But guess what? He's, he is doing a work in me. I am being changed from glory to glory. And, and I'm not going to give up. You know, I've, I've been, you know... I don't even want to talk. See, I don't even want to refer back to what I forgot. <laughs> it's just like, ah, I don't even, it just curls my body up in a, a fetal position. I don't want to, I don't want to think about that. I just want to press toward Jesus. And, I, and since he's made me a shepherd, I want to get, grab as many people and say, let's keep going. Let's go after Jesus. This is it. This is eternal. This is what his heart is. This is the logos of God. Where he's opening himself up to us. He's revealing himself and drawing us with that revealing unto his, not just his feet, but to his very heart and being. And, you know, well, could you tone it down a little bit with the, some of the weird things that you say? You know, what half of the weird things that people think I say are just truth. They're just the truth as it is in Jesus. The other half, I can't tone it down. It's going to come out of the oh, it's an earthen vessel. This is his vessel. You know, you say, well, why can't you be more like me? That's what you're thinking, right? And I'm thinking. H-E double hockey stick, no. No. Not that this is right, but I'm sticking with this, see. I'm sticking with the way he made me, and I'm not going to start acting like some pious priest or something, you know. So anyway, so let's pray.
Father, I am so inadequate just to explain the beauties that you breathe upon me. You, you don't even teach me. You just breathe and life and light comes and it's just amazing to me. But, but once it gets into me, the flow out of me feels so small compared to how big it came in. So I pray for each and every person on Skype and those that are here and those that will listen to these or watch these things later. I pray for, for your spirit to move upon them and to reveal yourself as the word made flesh. And from there we can begin to discern you. Father, thank you for these classes. Thank you for the people that are with us that have come into this room tonight and that are on Skype. Lord, their hearts yearn and long for you. They yearn and they long for you. And I pray that you'll fill their cup. That you'll fill their cup up, Father. I cover them in the name of Jesus and Satan. I resist every attack from every one of them in Jesus' name. And I ask that your spirit, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he'll lift up a standard, and that standard is the cross. And it breaks the back of the enemy, breaks the power of the enemy. I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.